Good morning and welcome to those of you that are here as well as those of you that are out there listening to us from your living rooms or on your telephones or wherever it is, Lord, is gracious to us that we are able to communicate in this way. We say this morning that we welcome our Lord Jesus in our midst. I have several announcements for you. Um, they're on the back of the flyer that you have, as well as they've been communicated through the email. Um, but the most important thing that we're focused on right now is prayer for September, because we're planning on doing a fall fun festival, Ignite the Light, and where our prayers are that we're able to, that nothing comes against it, as well as it's a blessed event. That's the main the main announcement this morning. Um, and then I, I just, I know that um, there's been a lot going on in the world. Would you agree with me? A lot going on in the world. And sometimes our focus gets misdirected. So this morning I'd like for us just to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we say come, Holy Spirit, come in this day, in this hour, and be here with us, Lord. We need your forgiveness. We need your restoration, Lord. Restore us, commission us. Help us to go forward and fulfill your purpose, Lord. Help us to be able to tell the truth about who you are. Help us to be the light. Help us to keep from our own inward desire to suppress what you have to say. For we know, Lord, that as we lift our hearts to you, we're asking for clear direction and your peace that peace that surpasses all understanding. We're living in a tumultuous time, Lord. We're seeking to draw into a deeper and closer relationship with you. There's a great deal of confusion and it's hard to distinguish between the truth and the lies. But Lord, your truth, should we sit quietly and say, Lord, I need to hear you. Your quiet whisper. You tell us what it is that needs to be done, both individually and as a collective community, Lord. Help us as Christians and followers of you, Lord Jesus, to rise up in this time for us to have a clear voice. For it is God's love, your love, your way, your righteousness, your kingdom, your justice, that is needed in such a time as this. So this morning, as Pastor Scott brings forward the message that you have for him with regard to our need for forgiveness and restoration, for your desire to commission us, Lord, so that we can go forth, help us to sit quietly and listen for our instruction. We thank you, Lord God, that we're able to come together in worship and praise as to who you are. It's in your precious and holy name that we lift this service to you and our hearts to you and our people to you. For, Lord, we believe and we pray in the precious and holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Once again, good morning. Welcome. Those of you who are... Here in person, those of you who are watching online, whether it be Sunday morning or Sunday night, whenever, uh, wherever it is you might be watching us, um, welcome, to, uh, welcome to church, welcome to, to worship this morning. And let's, um, if you're here, please stand as we uh, open the service with a few songs. Um, this first song, and actually all the songs kind of relate to, um, and hopefully they support the, uh, the, the sermon Pastor Scott's going to bring you today and the... Uh, the Bible often refers to uh, us formally being in chains, but Christ broke those chains, and uh, he set us free, and let's sing this song of, of victory. Um, Greg, if you wouldn't mind leading this for us, that'd be, that'd be great. Please stand. trying to fill the same old holes inside 
Well, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you He's got, got pain, He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, He's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking Savior. If you got chains, He's a chain breaker. But we've all searched for the light of the day in the dead of night. And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. But we've all run to things we know just ain't right. When there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel hard, He's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking Savior. If you got chains, He's a chain breaker. If you receive it, if you can't feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can't feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, save him. He's a prison shame savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Let's get the Lord a hand this morning. Righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness, 
is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. So take my heart. more song it's a uh, it might be a new song we haven't done it here before but you might have heard it on the radio it's again a song of freedom a, a song that of um, knowing that that all my hope is in the chorus says all my hope is in Jesus and thank God that yesterday's gone that we've had that forgiveness and you know as Pastor Laurie had referred to Pastor Scott will be pre- preaching this morning in the next passage from the Gospel of John and It's about forgiveness, restoration, and then his commission and purpose for our lives. So let's sing this, sing sing out the song in in victory and in praise. I've been 
be seated and this time we're going to play a song it's a, a song of special music but if you have as we're playing it if you have your um, your offering you brought it with you this morning you can bring it forward at this time um, to the offering plates here in the front and Olivia if you wouldn't mind
I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God I'm going to invite you at this time to come forward for communion. So let us go to the one who would find us wherever he needed to come to find us. And for each of us, that's been a different place, has it not? The Lord found us right where we were. He found us in our own unique place, our own unique way, when we were far from him. And he came and he showed himself to us once more, the one who was crucified the one who became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So we go to him again this morning, and we say thank you over and over and over for the gift that only he can give and only we can receive. To Christ be the glory. Come forward down the side aisles, receive your communion, and go back down the center, please, to keep from bumping into one another. Come now and receive the Lord's offering to you. Take now his body and drink of his blood and be one with your Savior. The word this morning comes from John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to Peter again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to Peter a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Peter replied, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. 
This Jesus prophesied, signifying to what death Peter would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. The word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Well, believe it or not, we have after this Sunday just two more weeks in John, and we will have completed it. I don't know who remembers me telling you that it would take just over two years. Anybody remember that? And guess what? I've been here just over two years. So it's worked out that the Lord has given us an opportunity to, get th- to go through this wonderful, wonderful book and to meet the Lord personally. But today, I hope to talk to you about maybe one of the most important things you'll ever hear. The absolute exact mission for which every one of us has been called and every one of us must answer to. When you stand before an officer of the Army or the Marines, the Coast Guard, the Navy, the Air Force, you raise your right hand. You put your hand, used to, sometimes people can refuse to now, put your hand on a Bible, and then you would bring the oath of office to which you had been called, your commissioning. For those in the, uh, the enlisted corps, it's a non-commissioned officer's creed. And for those as officers, it's the commissioned officer's creed. But they support one another. And they pledge that even if it would be my life, I would freely give it in defense of those that I love. And that's exactly what God has called us to do as Christians. You, are, you have been called to be part of an army. Not necessarily an army with a weapon in your hand as traditional would think of, but with the armament of the armor of God to protect you, the word of the Lord to testify to, and your witness to what he has done in your life. By blood, by soul, by spirit, you've been called to be commissioned. And I hope today you will hear that in the words of our Lord as he spoke to Peter, but the rest were sitting there listening. Remember that message, or maybe you don't, when I talked about betrayal and denial three times on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter had an opportunity to testify to him, and instead he each time betrayed and each time denied the name of Jesus. We're going to go back and visit part of that too. So this morning, I'd like to bring a message to you that you have been forgiven by Christ. Not a little bit, but all the way. All of your sins have been removed. Your old life disappeared and you were restored to a new life so that you could be in relationship with the one who created you, your heavenly father in heaven. That that relationship would be eternal but then that he would claim the right to have you raise your right hand, bow your knee before him, and swear to him allegiance with all that you are as he gave you all with his only son. To bring purpose and direction to your life that you did not have before you knew him, and that you may go forth to bring purpose and direction to the lives in which you speak and to those that you serve. That is the message I hope you will get this morning. Recall from last week at the breakfast with Jesus, his followers were celebrating being just in his presence, the risen Savior. During this encounter, Jesus fully revealed himself to them and started the process of handing over his divine mission to them. As the Father has sent me, so now I send you. So what what question could we ask? What's really happening then in this part of the conversation between Jesus and Peter as the others listen in? The first thing we're going to hear is that Jesus forgives Peter. He forgives him three separate times, once for every time he had betrayed and denied him. The second thing we're going to see is that Jesus restores Peter after that betrayal and denial of him as Lord on the night he was arrested. Jesus then commissions Peter to be his ambassador and witness to the world. 
And Jesus gives Peter purpose. He brings direction and meaning to his life. You will no longer be simply fishing. You will be fishers of men. Peter's first betrayal and denial of Jesus was to a person that was a total stranger. Do you remember who that was? That first time he was standing there in the courtyard of Caiaphas' house. In John chapter 18, verse 17, we read these words. And the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also one of these, this man's disciples, are you? And look at his reply. I am not. The Gospel of John has been about what? The great I am saying I am. I am that I am that I am. That I am. And look at Peter's response. How does he reply to knowing Jesus? I am not. It's a betrayal of the divinity of God. It's the betrayal of the knowledge that God exists in the world. It's not just a person. It's serious stuff. But this woman didn't know him. If you go back and read the rest of the passage, you'll read this. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, there's that guy again, was able to talk the servant girl into letting Peter in because she didn't know Peter at all. But she knew him. And so this is a total stranger. You sound Galilean. You can't be one of those guys too, are you? And Jesus' first forgiveness and restoration of Peter coincides with this. In verse 15 of today's passage, we read this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus' command, feed my lambs. Each of these commands is unique. And if you were to read them carefully in Greek, you would read this. Now go and give little spoonfuls of food and nourishment to the very, very young, the ones who have no knowledge of me whatsoever. To a total what? Stranger. You imagine Peter hearing these words? Going back to that first time he denied, seeing this woman he did not know who did not believe in Jesus, and then hearing those words. Jesus is immediately commissioning Peter too, though. He instructed him then to evangelize all the lost people, all the little lambs, and bring them into the fold of God. Make them part of the sheep herd. Bring them from wherever you meet them. Peter's direction and purpose that morning is a twofold love of God and others. Jesus was asking him, desiring him, to love him more than anything else in his life, even the other disciples, even his wife and family, even his friends, even his own life. Jesus was also desiring him to love the lost at any cost. Because at the end, he tells him how he's going to die. Upside down, crucified on a cross. Do you really love me? Do you realize that when you go out and speak to the lost, one of them will betray you like you betrayed me? And they will come and they will take you and they will hold you fast when you are old against your will. Do you really love me? Will you love others no matter the cost in my name? Think about today, folks. Think about how we're going. Think about how bad this is getting and think about how much worse it's going to get because it is. There will come a day when you, when you try to mention the name of Jesus Christ, they won't just burn your church down. They'll come for you. Do you really love the Lord at any cost? Is a lost soul, does it matter more than your own life? There's a Lucan parable that goes with this. And the young lady for us this morning, Olivia, just sang the song. Would you leave the 99? She had no idea this was in my message. 
But since Luke's concept is here, the loss, we read this. Now all the tax collectors and all the sinners were coming near to Jesus to listen to him preach. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives the little lambs, the lost. He receives sinners, and he eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found that little one, he lays it on his shoulders, that's what you do with a lamb, and he rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and all of his neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my little sheep which was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. Peter's second betrayal and denial of Jesus was to a person who was an everyday acquaintance. Do you remember this one in the garden that night? When Simon Peter stood and warmed himself there around the fire, therefore they said to him as a group, <clears throat> you're not also one of these disciples, his disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, there it is again, I am not. But who was this group? <clears throat> this group was people who had seen him before. As a matter of fact, they were part of the guards who had just gone out to the garden to arrest Jesus and they were there when Peter drew his sword. So they're at least what? An acquaintance, are they not? They at least know who you are. These would be the people that you would go into a store or into a shop at, gas station, whatever, and you would constantly frequent that place and they would at least know you by face. Maybe you'd had a conversation with them. Maybe they knew you were a Christian. Maybe you had talked to them about Christ at one time. But if nothing else, they know who you are. They know where you live approximately, and they know that you frequent certain places. And so Jesus' second forgiveness and restoration of Peter matches it again. Watch this. Jesus said to Peter a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you really love me? And Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now look at the change in the command. And Jesus said to him, then go tend my sheep. Go tend the ones that already belong. Go tend the ones who are older. But the word tend there is serve. So the first one was seek and save the lost. This one is serve everyone. Serve those who are acquaintances. Serve those within the house of God. Serve them all. Be a person that is a servant. Remember what Jesus said? If you would follow me, you would have to be a servant of all. For the Son of Man did not come into the world to be served, but to serve. And Peter would have heard this and would have thought back to that moment as well. Peter's commission immediately is instructed to care for everyone in his community. Those he knows, those he doesn't know, mere acquaintances, and even those within the group of the disciples. Peter's direction and purpose is again twofold, and it's very, very similar. He should love the Lord more than he loves anything else in his life, but then he should desire more than anything else to love everyone by serving them in his name. He's not preaching to them. He's not calling to them. He's just serving their needs. And this is from Matthew and Mark, that concept. In Matthew, the Matthew, the Mathenian and Mark, and say that a couple times quick, parable, would go something like this. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages and teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among them. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw there a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like what? They were like sheep without a shepherd. There was no one to tend them. And he began to teach them many things. And then he turned around and said to his disciples, you see, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are so few. Therefore, beseech and ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. Now it was already quite late, 
And the disciples came to him and said, this place is so desolate that we've come to in the boat, and it's already getting late. Send these people away that they may go back into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. <clears throat> Couldn't do that in New Jersey, though. The restaurants would be closed. Uh, but, but he answered them, you give them, you serve them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 days wages on bread to give them one little thing to eat each? And he replied, how many loaves do you have with you? And when they had found out, they said, we have five loaves and two dried fish. And he commanded them to sit down in groups all over the green grass in the pastures where they were. And they sat down in groups of 100 and in groups of 50. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves. And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before the others. And then he divided up the two fish among them as well. They all ate. They were all satisfied. And they picked up 12 full baskets, one for each of the apostles besides. Still full. Remember, you give them something to eat. And when you do not have, I am the God of miracles. I will even supply the basket full of food if you only believe. But serve as I have served you. Who remembers the breakfast now with the bread and the fish? First he gave them the bread, and then he gave them the... Here we go again. There was over 5,000 that day from the country of Israel. Peter's third betrayal and denial of Jesus was to a person who was personally injured by him himself or to a relative who knew him. How many times have I injured someone and professed to be a Christian? How many times do you think the Church of Christ willingly, unwillingly, and maybe even sometimes maliciously have hurt others and destroyed the name of Christ. What's the one thing you keep hearing from people all the time about us? You're just a bunch of hypocrites. See, Peter can't deny this because just a few minutes ago, what did he, that, that night he had chopped off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Just a few days later, Jesus was back talking to him about it. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him named Malchus, whose ear Peter had cut off, said, did I not see you? <laughs> Imagine the cousin. I'm surprised what a fight didn't break out right there. Didn't I see you in the garden with him? And look what Peter says again. I am not. And immediately, a rooster crowed. Who remembers the prophecy? Before the rooster crows this morning, you will have denied me three times. But this is now someone Peter is responsible for. This is now someone that he gave the worst witness he could possibly give to. He drew a weapon. He almost took a life. He could have easily just took his head off and just missed by a second. Remember what Jesus did, though? Picked up the ear and made it new. And what did he tell Peter? I don't want you to wield that kind of sword. Put it away. I want you to wield a sword of truth the one that I give to you when the Holy Spirit comes. So Peter's next forgiveness is this. Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Except the do you love me this time is do you love me more than life, more than soul, more than body, more than anything that you could possibly hold dear? And Peter was grieved. Because he had asked him a third time and asked it in such a way that it cut him to the heart. Do you really love me? Then Peter comes out with this. Lord, you know all things. You know all three I am nots. You've told me so. You must have seen them from the inner chamber as I said them. 
but you know this. I would give my life for you. Remember Peter on the night of the Last Supper? I will go and I will die with you. Remember what Jesus said? Oh, Peter, Peter, Satan would like to sift you like wheat, like chaff, like flour. And I will pray that when this passes, you will be restored. There's the restoration. And then you will lead your brothers and your sisters. And then Jesus gives him a different command. Now, when you go to feed the sheep, the word there means to bind the sheep. Bind up the wounds you have caused. Fix those who are broken. Can you hear Jesus? Seek the lost, serve them all. Bind up the broken. What if the people of God, of this nation, of this world, suddenly took this to heart? What if we started doing that all the time? What if we asked for personal forgiveness for those we have hurt outside the faith? What if we asked for forgiveness for those within the faith that we've stabbed in the back? What would happen to the world? It would suddenly change. And the kingdom of God would come quite close. Peter's commission here is instructed to care for everyone who has been injured by him or the church. Doesn't matter which. Doesn't matter whether he did it personally or the church did it. And that's us, folks. Whether we did it in anger, pride, selfishness, lack of concern or care. A fight over changing the carpet is such a fight. It's ridiculous to me with some of the things I have seen as a pastor over the years in different congregations just wandering through and watch what they'll argue about. It's not lovely at all. I have had people come after me, come after my wife for preaching the word of God and preaching the truth and want us gone. You know why? They don't want to change. I've had people come to me and say, you must have some ulterior motive when they have one of their own. And they're just projecting it on to me. But every time I've ever done anything wrong to anyone, in the church, wherever I've been, and I've been brought to my attention, whether I knew it or not, you know what I did? Ate humble pie. I am sorry. I need your forgiveness. If we all started doing that, the world would have to say, they're not hypocrites, they're the real deal. And then they'd have to deal with the fact that the Lord is real indeed. And you know what they'd be forced to do? Either come to him and change, or rebel and know they're rebelling. There'd be no in between, would there? It would become black and white, would it not? Yes? Yes. And again, the direction and purpose is the same. Do you love God more than anything else first, even if it meant your life? Because it did for Peter. And it did for all the rest except John. Jesus desires me to love the broken, the abused, the cast off, the ones where families have torn apart families, especially over faith, where communities are destroyed, where rioting and looting is taking place, where schools will open in fear, where balloting will not be secure. He's asking me to keep standing up for the truth and to keep helping, but speak truth no matter whether they like it or they don't. He's asking me to do whatever is necessary to be his ambassador as if he was in me on earth and you. But anyone who's hurt, anyone who's abused, and anyone who's alienated, that should be our first cause. And right now, folks, the cabal is trying to hide what they've been doing for years to the least of these, and you know what I'm talking about. It should sicken us to know those in power have hurt the littlest of the lambs. It should sicken us so much that we should demand retribution by justice right here and now. Hear the teaching of the Apostle Paul this morning. But now is the time to get rid of, in the group of us, as Christians, anger, rage, 
Malice behavior, slander, dirty language. Stop lying to one another. For you have stripped off the old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. Put on the new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be a holy people, you Nazarene Jew, he loves you. You must be clothe yourselves, therefore, with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you so that you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all of its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom that he gives to you. Sing psalms and hymns, even in California, and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Some of you get the humor. And whatever you do or say, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whether you build a building, whether you dig a trench and fix a water line, whether you play an instrument, whether you preach the word, whether you're a student in school, a teacher of students, grandmother or great-grandmother, grandfather or dad, do it all as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be obedient and faithful servants, no matter the cost. And there's one more caveat. No questions asked. How many people don't like that one? Okay, just me. No, nope, no, nope, three. No, nope, there's four now? Come on, people. How many don't like the fact that you're really not supposed to ask about the question, about well, 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 what comes next? Right? Remember Job? He was asking lots of them. What did he tell them? Job, shut your hole and listen to me. Just paraphrasing. Job, Job, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job, were you there when I created the behemoth in the field, the dinosaur's tail who wipes out a thousand cedar trees? Job, were you there when I hung the stars? Remember what Job had to say after asking all the questions? I put my head down to the earth, and I bless the Lord who made me, and the one who saves me now. And believe me, Job had a lot more to ask than we did. Go ahead and read that book sometime. Jesus is asking you today, do you love me? Don't go back on it. Do you love others, no matter what they do in return? Don't go back on it. Will you serve me no matter what I ask of you, even if it be your life? And don't ask me how. Believe. Because I am the God of miracles. I will provide for you as needed. St. Paul tells us that in the moment that you are being held to the last, do not even worry about what you will say in that hour, for the Holy Spirit himself will at that moment speak for you. Right? Most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked and you did whatever you wanted. Remember those days it was called 2019. Oh, I I'm sorry. But, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will grab you fast and he will carry you and do whatever they want to you against your wishes. As Jesus prophesied, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God, 
Now, being, now imagine him looking you right in the eye and saying, in about 20 years, that's it. And you'll have no say in it, and you have to do it. And here it is now. See? Imagine hearing that. And then imagine Jesus looking you right in the eye and said, no more questions. Listen to the command. Don't worry about anybody else. Follow me. Watch your own lane. Follow me. Don't get your eyes over here. Don't get them over there. Don't worry about the election on November 3rd. Coronavirus will be cured on November 4th. Trust me. Don't worry about those things. They're going to happen. Do all you can, but don't worry about it. Follow me. Follow me. It's going to be more critical than not that you learn that more than anything else. Listen to me. I'm warning you. And I love you because I'm doing it. Get to, get to the point where you just say, yes, Lord. Follow me. Yes, Lord. To your will and to your way. We even sing a song like that, don't we? Peter died a martyr's death, hung upside down on a cross. How do we know this? We have all those sources. Isn't that amazing? Jesus makes a bold proclamation that he makes sure every one of these guys writes it down. <laughs> Eusebius wrote it in his history of the Roman Empire. Clement of Rome, one of the first bishops of the church, going far back, wrote down what Eusebius had told him and what others had seen with their own eyes. They were still alive. Ignatius of Loyola said, I got it from those of old. Irenaeus of Leon said, I got it from Ignatius and those of old. And it just kept going. Because when it came time for Peter to die, here's what we heard. I am so not worthy. It's, you cannot crucify me. You can't. I can't die like him. Only one person can die that way. Hang me upside down that I may look up to heaven while I die and see the world the right way. Ever think about that? Anybody ever hang upside down for a long time? Where are your eyes pointing? Aren't they? Where are you going real soon? Jesus' single mission that morning long ago and today in our hearing again was to offer everyone forgiveness that he had accomplished once for all by dying on the cross. And by his resurrection to restore to us the relationship I lost by my own selfish actions, my own words, and my own thoughts against the Lord. He wanted me to be with my Papa again in heaven. The one who loved you and knew you before you ever were. But then he wanted to make me understand something. I've been commissioned to serve. And that commission can never be taken back because the penalty is treason. And the penalty is not only physical death, but eternal separation. He wanted me to understand that when I raised my hand, that was it. There was no going back. Because there was no going back for him. He went all the way, did he not? Yes, Dad, I will go when it is time. He gave direction to me. I didn't know what to do with my life. I wanted to be a rich doctor. My parents were pretty poor. And I was like really, really smart, so it was like really, really easy. I had a photographic memory. I'd sit in class and they'd say something, I'd just go, uh, A. Hey. Right? People get so mad at me, even my wife when I was dating her. Are you gonna study? Eh, I got it. And on those days I'd get cocky and get a 94 and get an A minus, and I'd be like, oh, I better study. See, I was going to do it my way, cocky, arrogant, make lots of money. Halfway through my master's, one year from getting my PhD, I was going to get an MD, PhD, so I could study, teach, do it all. Nobody could tell me what to do. Yeah. One and a half more years, I'd have that PhD, go off to medical school for two more, finish early because I took all the other courses in anatomy and physiology. I had it all worked out. And the Lord, one night while I was finishing up something at my desk, getting ready to start the PhD program the next day, said, do you love me more than these? Whew. 
See, as a Catholic, I, I did a real big mistake. My parents called me Scott Andrew, and I thought, wow, you know what I'll do? I'll take a confirmation name of the brother, because I was hot-tempered, and I figured maybe Peter could help. I didn't realize in that moment what I was asking. I was asking to be like him. I was asking to be humbled. And the Lord literally told me, you go down this road, you go it yourself. You'll make lots of money. You'll be successful. Don't look for me when you die. I will not be there. Do you love me more than money? Do you love me more than control? And I had heard that when I was seven years old as an altar boy ringing bells as the cup was being raised. I had heard that voice before ask the very same question. And I had answered yes when I was seven. But between somewhere between 10 and 15, I went off like a cannon in my own direction. And my father said, I hope someone humbles you someday. <laughs> Fathers have a way of praying for you. And I went home that night at 2 o'clock in the morning, woke up my wife and said, we're leaving the PhD program. We're not going to medical school. We're packing up our bags. I'm joining the military to repay my loans. And then I'm going to seminary, and I'm going to be a chaplain. And God's called me to be the ministry. And my wife said, what have you been drinking? Because <laughs> back in those days, I, I, I was a Catholic, and I was a Polish Catholic, and a German Catholic, and a Not making fun of Catholics, I'm just saying they like to celebrate. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? Nothing. But I was a little bit of a drinker here and there. Whenever I'd have a little problem, I'd have a little snort. My father's remedy for lots of things. Never got drunk, hardly ever. When I was 16, I did it a couple times, but I have a little thing. And I'd say, I haven't been drinking a thing. The Lord told me that he's going to kick me out of heaven if I don't do it tomorrow morning. She sat up in bed. Trying to get, you know, you ever, you ever get woke up at like 2.30 when you're in a deep sleep and you just can't even figure out whether the phone's ringing or how to grab it? And she said, I'll get some coffee. I know you don't, I don't like it. I'll get myself some tea. Let's sit in the living room. You drive me crazy. I don't know why I married you. <clears throat> and we sat there and I told her something I didn't tell her before I married her other than just kind of in passing that I thought God had called me to be a priest when I was eight years old. But you see, I had troubles. I liked girls too much. And um, <clears throat> that's a joke, too. You can laugh. <clears throat> um, and I didn't know how to reconcile the love of a wife and ministry. But while I was getting my master's degree, I became a Protestant because I had found things in my own faith I didn't agree with. And it's funny how the Lord does things, doesn't he? The minute that was out of the way, the minute I had gone in a different direction, I had opened myself up to the call that I had walked away from. And I saw Peter, and I saw myself, and I saw him say, do you love me? And I knew, you know what I knew? I'd be poor. I'd be dependent on other people to make my way in the world. And I would just have to serve and depend on God's people to be good to me. And here I am before all of you. God has never once not given me everything I ever needed. He's not giving me everything I wanted. That's good. Because if you knew me, you'd realize that that would be way too much. But he's always met my every need in exchange for, do you swear to uphold the book of the Bible? Do you swear to tell the truth? Do you swear you will give me your life if I ask? Are you willing to die for someone else? Do you love me more than these? God wants us, once we have our purpose and our direction, to give it away. To go to others and give them the same. Jesus did this for Peter and the other six disciples there on the shore. Jesus has done that for me. I just told you a little bit about it. Jesus has done that for you.
And if you don't know him completely, then today you can let us know, and we'll help you with that too. But Jesus desires to do this through us as faithful and obedient children. Jesus forgives me so that I will tell others how wonderful it is to be forgiven. So that I might share with them the good news that they could be forgiven too. Amen? Jesus has restored me and given me a new life and a new being in him so that I may offer to them a restored new life in him as well. That their old beat up life can be traded in on a brand new one. How many people got one of those cars you want to do that with? Jesus commissioned me to serve not only in the United States Army, but to be his chaplain, his voice to the world. And he has commissioned you as well with the gifts that he has given you, that you might serve others in his name. So you go out and you commission others too. It's called apostolic succession. Somebody prays over you and hands it down, and you pray over them, and they take a vow and you pass it down. That's how the church has grown, and that's how the church has been handed off every year since Christ left. Jesus gave me direction and purpose when I would be selfish, 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 left to myself. In belonging no longer to me, but to him, so that I may give direction and purpose to others, that they might live no longer for themselves as well, but for him. That's our message, isn't it? That's the gospel. So once again, hear this parable of the Apostle Paul. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. I have died with Christ. I no longer live. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't argue with one another like little kids. That's arguing in the what? In the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer because he's been raised. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us a ministry of reconciliation to share with others. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the whole cosmos, the universe, not just this world, to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the very same word of reconciliation. Now then, we've been commissioned as what? We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading right through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. This is my philosophy of ministry. I shared it with your board. Roman, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 13 to 21. When I went to seminary, they said, you have to have a philosophy of ministry. Find it. Write it down. Live it. This has been mine from the beginning, because you know why? It's a ministry of presence. I have to show up so he can. When I show up, he does. A ministry of presence. Remember what they loved so much about that morning on the beach? Who was present? Remember what they were drawn to? Him. Paul also taught us as believers and followers of God that each one of us has a unique set of gifts, skills, and talents given to us by the abiding Holy Spirit living within us in order for us to perform our own unique mission and purpose. And every one of us will look different than the others, and that's cool. I'll tell you something else. Every one of those unique missions all blend together to form a church that can do way more than it could ever think or imagine when it's brought together corporately. Final teaching and we're done. From the Apostle Paul again. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, 
So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members with one another. Having then gifts differing to the grace that has been given to us, let us use them. A commission to use your gifts. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This morning, here in our presence, Jesus is calling us again individually first. His call is going out. Come and follow me. Jesus is also calling us together corporately, all together as a body of Christ, as these believers who live right here in this area and go to this place. And the same phrase is being used. Together, come, all of our visions become his. Come and follow me. I'm going to ask you to pray about that this week. You've been forgiven to have your relationship with God restored. You have been restored so that you will accept the call on your life to be commissioned and non-commissioned officers in the name of Jesus Christ, to go into the world to seek the lost, serve everyone, and bind up the wounds of the lost and the broken, to take the direction and purpose he has given you and pass it on. Do you know what's missing today in our society? Direction and purpose. Who agrees with me? Well, I got a few more hands. That's good. Because you see, that's what's missing sometimes from the president's office, from the Congress, from the Senate, from our governor's offices. It's missing everywhere. It's missing in some of the teaching in our schools. It's missing everywhere. And why? Because we have not found him. When we find him, there's direction and purpose. But we need to share that. We cannot keep it to ourselves any longer. There has been the greatest fault of the church. We've been silent way too long. We've decided that we're going to be friendly. We've decided that we're worried about our reputation so we won't rock the boat. We've decided not to get into public office because there's two things you shouldn't talk about. What are they? Politics and religion. And you know what you should be doing is talking about them all the time. And guess what? If your religion was right, your politics would be Right, and guess what you'd be telling people? Their direction and purpose, wouldn't you? Do you know how many people this, this fall, this early winter, are going to vote for somebody just because it's not somebody? I, I watch all the time. I, I'd vote for him if he was weekend at Bernie's and they had to prop him up. I'd vote for him just because he's not him. Really? Really. That's interesting. That's because there's no direction or purpose, and they don't know where they're going. If we do our job right, you wouldn't tell them how to vote. They'd know how to. So many well-meaning Christians, but I believe in a social justice. No, don't believe in social justice. Believe in gospel justice. There's a big difference. Social justice is done by the government. Gospel justice is done by the people of God. Social justice requires all kinds of rules and the taking of money and the redistribution of money until everybody's poor. Gospel's justice is when the people of God dig deep into their pockets and give more than they ever have and direct that money and do it themselves. And one-on-one, -on -one, we change lives one by one. We change hearts and minds one-on-one. -on -one. You see what Jesus is talking about here? You know what he's talking about? He's talking about God's love, God's way, God's justice, God's kingdom come. May we be found faithful. May we do more than we've ever done before for the sake of the glory of the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.
<clears throat> we have one more song we're going to sing in before we close the service, and it's one you're very familiar with. It's the, uh, an old song, "Amazing Grace." Uh, please, please stand as we uh, as we sing out to Him this morning. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you all. The grace, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <clears throat>